So much can change in a single week. Markets got one slightly positive data point and all the fear, uncertainty and doubt was removed from the minds of investors and traders. So with inflation and the economy cooling, what happens next? And when does soft data become outright bad data? That's what we're here to talk about today and small caps. We'll be diving into everything about the S&P 600 and the Russell 2000. Stanley Drunken Miller bought a ton of IWM calls in his latest 13F and more often than not, he is right. So we're going to talk about why, key levels, and potential price targets for small caps. We're also going to be diving into sentiment earnings this week and why this chart is the only chart we need to be looking at. Will markets go higher? Is the economy in good shape? What lies ahead for us this week? We've got a lot to talk about, so let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, and like this video, and also leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. This is the weekly heat map of the S&P 500. And guys, when you have the big names participate, you're just going to get an overall green week. Stuff like Tesla up 5% for the week, you know, JP Morgan, Berkshire here in financials, Nvidia, AVGO, AMD, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Walmart, Costco. And when the big names are moving to the upside, the sectors move to the upside. And when the sectors move to the upside, that's when you get positive market momentum in the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, etc. But diving into sectors for this week, GDX was the best performing sector along with metals and mining. And a lot of that had to do with just some hawkish Fed speak we saw on Friday. But before Friday, it was software, technology, and semiconductors. They were the real leaders. It was only metals and mining and GDX came on afterwards after, you know, we had a bit of an inflation scare just with some of the Fed speakers saying that they don't think it's time to cut rates anytime soon, pushing rate cuts out to 2025. And that did spook the market ever so slightly. However, still a very positive week across the board. 1.65% here for the S&P 500. And, you know, the sectors that beat the S&P 500 were growth sectors as well as rate sensitive sectors. Look at stuff like XLRE, uh, regional banks, semiconductors, software as well. And then we do know why commodities put up a pretty green day. It was very positive commodity momentum there on Friday. Now, those that underperformed the SPY are not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, XLF financials up 1.58%, utilities 1.5%, energy 1.2%, XLC 1%. That's still very great gains. It's just that the SPY did more. And then the worst performing sector for the week was actually industrials with a negative gain of negative 0.28%. So all in all, a very positive week. Not much more to say when it comes to sector analysis. Now, looking at the individual indices, so gold, GLD, put up a 2.26% week. Very, very positive. And that's why gold miners and the commodity sector as a whole was up. The NASDAQ was 2%, so definitely a large cap growth focused week. Followed by IWM, so smalls did put in work. Same with the S&P 500. The Dow Jones was up 1.24%. Very, very positive week here in the market. Even with the RSP, the broader market gained a full percentage point, even though industrials did lose 0.28% there. And we also saw bonds put up a very positive week. I mean, from Wednesday, they did go down. That's for sure. But, you know, bonds did gain. And that's why we saw a lot of the positive momentum. If yields are going to go down, that's going to actually be good for stocks, particularly with where rate cuts are. And that's why stocks were up, bonds were up. And that is still the play right now. You know, stocks up, bonds up until we actually get inflation, you know, CPI in between two to three percent right now it's at 3.6 percent until we actually get inflation in that range we're going to see bonds and stocks move in tandem now let's hop on the charts so looking at the charts today we're going to look at the s p 600 do a weekly overview yesterday we did the s p 500 so go check out yesterday's video if you want the full recap as to i believe what the s p 500 is going to do next week key levels as well as gamma zones and my overall directional bias so that's in yesterday's video so today we're going to look at the s p 600 and you can see it this is the weekly chart and we all know we've been in this correction in time here and we're beginning the early process of a break Breakout, which started with the rally here in October, we've made quite significant gains and actually had a new 52 week high in the S&P 600. Now, looking at the most recent weekly candle, we can see a couple of glaring things. Now, it is a green body candle and we are positive for the week. S&P 600 was up 1.08% there for the week. However, we saw a lot of selling pressure come in at the highs, but we actually did go and make a new 52 week wick high. So essentially that is a higher high coupled with a equal low. Now, if we hop onto the daily chart, we can actually see some glaring things. This equal low we were talking about earlier, it's actually on the 200 moving average. So this white line is the 200 SMA. We bounced right off this level and then rallied, you know, five, six percent to hit that new 52 week high. Now, at the same time, we can also see the RSI not quite at overboard territory, but definitely above the 50 level 
right here. So there is still room to run to get to overboard territory in the IWM, and that probably does mean more upside. However, you can definitely see that in the last three days of the week, we did par quite a bit of the week's losses after that massive jump on Tuesday, Wednesday, after the cooler than inspected inflation data. At the same time, this rally that we've had in the last month or so during May has been on great breadth. We can actually see that the ADL line right here has actually moved up to new all-time highs as we made a new 52-week high. And actually zooming in a little bit, you can actually see that right here, we made an all-time high in the ADL line when we actually did move down in the IWM. So despite being down three days in a row in the S&P 600, we actually saw more stocks move higher. So we had more issues moving up than they were moving down. And again, this is a positive divergence and it often does result and it often does result in price action moving to the upside, often taking out the subsequent highs. Looking at the daily chart as a whole, we definitely are in an uptrend. You can see we are making higher lows at the same time making highs. And this actually is a new 52 week high. And that's very, very constructive. What we need to do right now is that we've made it all this way. We just need to push higher. And there definitely is some bullish sentiment looking at small caps as a whole. We do know that Stanley Drunken Miller bought a ton of IWM call options, and he's probably looking at stuff like small cap earnings, which is expected to be not just double digits, but very close to high teens, low 20s earnings growth rate here in 2024, 2025. And that's a very similar growth rate to the S&P 600. So there's definitely tailwinds with low valuations, high growth in these stocks. And that's why we're actually seeing somewhat of a bottom form especially at this especially above the 1200 level here in the sp600 so we can definitely see that buyers are stepping up at these levels and we're definitely you know keeping price above the 200 moving average so what does this mean for the s p600 well it's very very simple the bulls have put themselves in a very very good position i think what we need to do early into next week is probably just see a bit of a pullback here find some support and then continue the rally to the upside. This looks very, very strong, very, very constructive. If we do pull back a little bit, I think it's going to be very short lived. And then we do bounce higher. It's just where do we bounce higher after making a pullback? Well, there's two key levels I'm looking at right now. The very first key level is actually this level right here. Okay. The 1322 level. And then the second level is actually the 1269 level. Now, the reason these two levels are key levels is because if we actually zoom out, we can see that this level right here was used by resistance when we touched once twice and three times right here. And the reason this level is very key is because we also used it as resistance at the very top right here. And it was the top of this huge consolidation period before we actually made the massive move lower in 2021. Now, are we actually going to pull back all the way to 1270 after coming all this way? I don't think so. I think 1323 should provide good support for this week, should find support here and then move higher, especially if we go ahead, break these highs right there. That's going to be very constructive. And then we can actually go break some key levels that we haven't seen since Jan 2022 and early 2021. So that's what I'm seeing right now. So, you know, this week, if the bulls really want to get going, you could probably see a pullback here to the 132 level and then a move to the upside, especially as we exit this earnings season, which was the inflection quarter and move into, you know, higher expected earnings. We are expecting negative 4.46% here in the S&P 600 for the second quarter 2024, but then we ramp up in a very big way, 11.92%, 17.06% in the third and fourth quarter, then the first and second quarter 2025, 23.75% and then 20.1%. So four big quarters upcoming after we post the inflection quarter year in the second quarter. Earnings are looking very, very constructive for a move higher. We just have to see those materialize. And if we do get better than expected earnings, especially with the valuations of the SP 600 trading at 14 times earnings, you know, we should see a move to the upside. So this week, if we do pull back, we can look at 13223 as a potential opportunity to get long, get in. If not, I think we're just probably going to rally early on in the week. If not, just trade sideways and then rally in the SP 600. This looks very constructive, very strong uh, for just a move higher, man. This is some of the strongest price action we've actually seen for a very long while. I mean, this right here, very, very strong compared to this choppiness we saw compared to this choppiness we saw this reminds me of some of the price action we're seeing right here at the moment some very very strong candles and i do think that you know any type of pullback we do get we're going to buy the dip very very quickly and move to the upside targets we could look to i would say um you know the psychological level uh 1375 should be the first target but really ultimately it should be that 1400 level that should be the next upside target there for the s p 
600. Now let's talk about the current market momentum. This right here is just looking at S&P 500 bull markets from 1950 to where we are right now. And essentially looking at the change, how long they were, when did they peak? And we can see that we have the start of the bull market here in 2022, October 12th. And then when this bull market essentially peaked. So generally speaking, the average bull market lasts five years, get 150% out of it. Our bull market is currently only 18 months. So one year and a half and has returned 43.4%. So there's still juice left in the tank according to these stats right here according to the average and on the very very high end you can actually see 267 percent gain 228 percent gain in 1990 crazy right 2009 400 percent 417 percent so there is still a lot of upside left here in the s p 500 at least according to this data now what's also very interesting did the bull market start in october of the 13 bull markets recorded six of them almost half started in october and so too did hours so having known all of this will this continue into the future well we got some commentary here from bofa and let's see what they have to say they talk about rate hikes retail sales as well as the all-important stagflation so let's have a read the april cpi report should reduce concerns that the economy is overheating because we got cool cpi inflation may be sticky but it's not re-accelerating the fed should take comfort from the Fed should take comfort from April price data, but services inflation is still running above target. The bar for hikes is high, although cuts are still although cuts are still off. Based on the details of the April PPI and CPI data, we expect core PC inflation to print 0.2% month over month, 2.8% year over year. By the way, PCE is the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation. CPI is, is heavily weighted to shelter. 43% of CPI is based on shelter, whereas PCE is closer to 25%. April retail sales, more noise than news. Meanwhile, April retail sales came in softer than expected. This was largely due to payback for a spike in non-store sales in March. Core control retail sales, which feed into GDP, are still running at 2.7% annualized over the last three months. We expect spending growth to remain solid in the coming quarter. So even though retail sales was weak, that did help the inflation narrative and overall sentiment. But retail sales still running at 2.7% annualized when you look at core control. Thematic views, no stag, just some flation. The stagflation narrative has resurfaced. We reject it. Instead, we see signs that services inflation is being driven by robust demand over supply. We think that the resilience in services demand is partly explained by income growth generated by the ongoing expansion in labor supply. Goods deflation could also be creating room for increased services spending. So there's a lot of dynamics at play playing into retail sales, people favoring services over goods, Whereas during the COVID era, it was less services, more goods, because people were locked up in their houses and that inflation is also decelerating. So this is everything you want to see in a bull market. You want to see strong retail sales. You want to see a strong consumer. You want to see disinflation and possibly rate cuts. We're getting all that. And that probably means the bull market can continue. Now, looking at sentiment, guys, our two OG indicators, the BOFA bull bear indicator and the Goldman Sachs sentiment indicator they are starting to move up as you can see in recent weeks here in the goldman sachs indicator we're at 1.5 well into stretch positioning and the bofa bull bear indicator has gone from the five mark just a couple of weeks ago to the 5.6 mark so essentially what's happening here is positioning is getting stretched we're moving more towards the sell side which is market momentum moving to the upside but we're still not in that overly stretched territory and in this case you want exposure to equities and if you already have exposure to equities you want to hold you don't want to sell because these indicators still have a lot of room to run now, i do know the goldman sachs sentiment indicator is very very high but generally when we get to stretch positioning we stay in here for quite a number of weeks and it's going to be no different this time we're probably going to stay above this one mark for a number of weeks to come. And that's going to coincide with the S&P 500 moving higher and the BOFA bull bear indicator probably pushing closer to the six level and maybe even the seven level. And once we get to these levels right here, seven, close to eight, maybe we've seen a number of weeks above one, closer to 1.5. That's when we can start looking at decreasing exposure, taking some profits, but for now, hold equities. Now let's dive into earnings. So we have a pretty pivotal week here. The very first and most obvious thing is we have Nvidia on Wednesday. Very, very big earnings. A lot of people are going to be watching that. But Nvidia isn't the only big name. We also have Snowflake. That's really going to affect software, that sector. And we saw software run up quite significantly in the past week. I think a lot of people are going to be looking to Snowflake in the software sector, as well as ELF, ELF just to see how the consumer is doing. You know, consumer stocks, beauty stocks, makeup stocks have had a rough go of it. So a lot of people are going to be paying attention to this. We also have Target. 
again with the consumer TJX analog devices. So a very big day of earnings on Wednesday, probably the biggest day this week. And on Tuesday, we don't have much of anything. And then Monday, again, Palo Alto, Zoom, Trip.com, going back to those software names. So a lot of big software names, key players in certain sectors, cybersecurity, video conferencing, the leisure sector, the travel sector, very big names. And then on Thursday, we have Ralph Lauren, we have Deckers, Intuit, Workday, TD Bank as well. So quite a lot of hyper growth names, software names that you want to be aware of this week. It's going to be a pretty big week of earnings, not necessarily volatile. Wednesday could definitely bring volatility, especially Thursday if Nvidia is to miss but a pivotal week of earnings and probably the last big week here for this earnings season. So we're going to pay close attention to it before we get a break from overall earnings. Now, where are we actually sitting with regards to earnings? Right now, earnings is sitting at 7.6% for the S&P 500 and revenue is at 3.8%. Now, looking forward, since this is the last week of earnings, what are our expectations for the next coming quarters? The expectations are actually higher. We're raising the bar up 4.2% year for revenue, 10.5% in the second quarter, 2024. And we really do need to start paying attention to this because S&P 500 earnings are wrapping up. We've had 446 companies report out of 500 in the S&P 500 or out of 501, I believe. The market is going to start pricing in second quarter and even third quarter earnings here over the next week, especially after this week is done. Looking at the S&P 500, this week, we have 17 companies reporting and then zero in the Dow Jones. And then the week after that, we have 10. So you know, really this week and next week after that, the S&P 500 earnings are pretty much done for the most part. Now, where does that leave us with valuation? Now, firstly, please forgive me for this image being very, very blurry. I couldn't get anything better. But the S&P 500 right now on a PEG basis is at 1.4 times on a free cash flow yield of 3.3% and trading at 20.9 times. Let's just call it 21x. Pretty pricey in my regard. I think 20 is fair value. 21 is getting a bit pricey. Now, if you do want value, look at energy, look at financials, look at real estate. And if you want growth, I would say look at stuff like info technology, healthcare, comm services. They also pay a pretty good free cash flow yield as well. Now, part of the reason why the equity markets are rallying has to do with rate cuts. And right now, futures are once more pricing in two rate cuts by the end of this year. This is what's happening. And you can see that the market uh, at the start of January was pricing in six to seven cuts. At one point, we were pricing in probably only one. We're now pricing in two, and I think this is probably what we're going to see. I think anywhere from two to three rate cuts for 2024 is the likely scenario, maybe even one to two. Let's call it one to three cuts. That's probably equilibrium. And you can see that's normally what happens. The market gets stretched to one side, gets stretched to the other side, and that's just how it goes. You know, market never ever just trades in a straight line. We normally trade the extremes with the truth being somewhere in the middle, which is two to three rate cuts for 2024. The question now is when do we get them? In July, September, November? It's yet to be seen. I favor closer towards the end of the year. The Fed will probably want to see more inflation progress or disinflation progress. So I my bet is closer towards the end of the year, maybe September, November, December, somewhere around there. But we could cut in July. We do know that the Fed wants a reason to cut and seeing weaker retail sales like we did this week, weaker inflation, softer inflation really bodes well for the Fed. And looking forward, we really have to look at the FOMC minutes this week to see what the Fed are going to say. Now, looking at the overall macro backdrop, this is the economic surprise index, and it's pretty much telling us what's happening with economic data in the US, Japan, emerging markets and Eurozone. Now, you can see that in the United States, uh, since the start of 2024, we had incredibly hot data, hot CPI, hot labor market, hot retail sales, and that meant economic data surprised to the upside. And that means data came in a bit hot. But since then, we've actually seen a softening of data and we've actually seen a move into the negatives which is good for, for a little bit, but we don't want to see a continued trend in this area because that means that the economy is weakening significantly more than what analysts expect. What we really want to see is a softening of data, but really to be at the zero line right here. We want the data to come in with expectations. If that's going to happen, markets will continue to rally. Like we're seeing in most other countries, emerging markets, very hot data, but slightly softening, still above the zero line. Same here in the Eurozone, slightly softening data, still above the zero line, which means we're still seeing positive revisions in data, positive announcements in data. And the same is true here with Japan. So all in all, data is softening across the board, but in other countries outside the US, still fairly elevated, if you ask me. Now, looking at liquidity, guys, 
Liquidity conditions are both in bid for the US and the Eurozone. We're above the bid zone. We're in turbo bid, uh, which is kind of crazy. We actually moved up. I thought we were going to pull back. That's not the case. And we're in officially in bid for the Eurozone and moving into the turbo bid area right here. And this is completely supportive for markets as a whole. Now, data this week, guys. So a fairly light week of data. FOMC minutes is going to be the big focus, as well as University of Michigan sentiment, durable goods and housing data. So on the 22nd, we get mortgage applications, as well as existing home sales and FOMC minutes. I believe that's Wednesday. Then on the 23rd, we get initial jobless claims and PMIs. The consensus expectations for that is 40.2 for the manufacturing PMI, and then services PMI is 51.6. And then we also have new home sales here on the 23rd. Expectation is 680K. Then on the 24th, we get durable goods. We're expecting negative 0.6% percent x transport 0.2 percent and then 0.1 percent on capital goods orders and then university of michigan sentiment coming in at 67.4 which is going to be in line with the previous which means sentiment is just going to flatline and we'll see we're going to keep a close eye on this data to see if it comes in below or above expectations what we really want to see is data come in line now especially with the softening retail sales and the softening inflation we don't want the data to soften too much because that could lead to problems down the road with regards to uneventful macro weeks they often are the best weeks for stocks we do have one major macro data release this week and oftentimes we do see returns in those weeks of 0.3 percent zero macro releases are often the best at 0.62 but we are we do have the second best week so according to stats we should see further upside in the s p 500 and not much in the way of volatility guys but if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers